AI usually likes to teach in a dialogue framework, but both because of Zoom and because of the numbers, I don't know how much of a dialogue we'll be able to conduct, but please, you know, if you have uh, questions, feel, <clears throat> feel free to uh, send them on the chat or if they're important enough, uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe even, even interject them. Um, okay, Masechet Rosh Hashanah is a brief Masechet, only four chapters, <clears throat> but it's actually a very challenging Masechet uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, the premier Mishnah scholar of recent generations, Yaakov Nachum Epstein, uh, when he wrote about Rosh Hashanah, said it's made out of different units and it's very hard to see how they're coordinated. He, in addition, uh, argued that the chapter divisions are way off uh, in, Masechet, uh, in Masechet Rosh Hashanah. Uh, when I read that, it was like, uh, waving a red flag in front of a bull. And uh, when I wrote my doctorate on this, on this track date, it's one of the first things I tried to do is to show that it can't be that the chapter divisions are mistaken, but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. In any event, Masechet Rosh Hashanah, uh, despite its brevity, I think is a very good laboratory for exploring uh, what Mishnah is, how it was put together, what makes it tick? Okay, so let's dive in. So I'd like to start off by just thinking, by trying to anticipate. Okay, just imagine uh, that each one of us is <clears throat> sitting and trying to put together something called Masechet Rosh Hashanah, the Torah Shabal Peh about Rosh Hashanah. Okay, about the, the festival that we call Rosh Hashanah. Now, what kinds of things do we imagine would be in this tractate? What would we expect to find there? Shofar. You expect to find the shofar there? Good. What else? Teshuva. Teshuva. No, we expect would not find... expect to find that there. Oh, you There's would not expect to, to find about it that. there. No. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. It comes to Tanakh, why would we expect to find that there? There's no reason in the world. It's okay, a, well, you're, you're, you're it's cheating. It's as far back from Yom HaZikaron, Zikaron Tula, as described in Tanakh, as, as attaching Shuvah to Chagas Sukkot. I mean, there's no way we would expect that to be there. Masechet Yomo would expect it to be there. Okay, good. Okay, so you're, you're, uh, you're cheating. You're looking at the Tanakh already. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that in a, uh, absolutely, because I'm planning to do that in another two minutes. So uh, when, we'll, we'll look at the Tanakh and we'll, and we'll, and we'll start, to, uh, start to see, but uh, based on our experience of Rosh Hashanah, we would expect to find Shuvah. Uh, based on the Tanakh, as Professor Kaplan points out, uh, we wouldn't expect it, but based on our experience, we would certainly expect to find Shuvah. What other things would we expect? What other things characterize Rosh Hashanah? I imagine, you know, we can imagine that the apple and honey we wouldn't find there. That's, that's just a min hug, you know, one or two other things like that, probably not. One well, thing we would I expect a final uh, discussion of how the Tanakh sees where the year begins. I mean, that we would expect to see. Right. Uh, we would expect uh, we'd expect it to, to, to be building on what the Tanakh has to say, has to say about Rosh Hashanah. Okay, um, so um, basically, all it talks about, as we'll see very shortly, is what we call shofar. Although, if you look in the Tanakh, you wouldn't even exactly get that. So let's let's start off first of all by saying, what 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 in fact do we know? Uh, sacrifices, right? Okay, we would expect perhaps sacrifices, although uh, in Seder Moed, not all the festivals describe the sacrifices, but several several of them do, right? In Yoma, Psachim, we have the sacrifices of Yom Kippur and uh, uh, last chapter of Sukkah. Right, last chapter of Sukkah doesn't exactly give you the sacrifice, it gives you Something about the sacrifices, how they divide up the uh, the 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 the, uh, the mishmarot, okay? But 
that, that would not be an unreasonable expectation. So let, let's start off by, by actually looking actually looking at the Tanakh. Is this the right? Yeah. Okay. Got the right one here. So what do we know about this festival from the Tanakh? Okay. The Beryl B'nai Yisrael in Parshat Emor, the Beryl B'nai Yisrael Emor, Bechodesh Hashvi Bechad Bechodesh, Yelachem Shabbaton, Zichron Truam Mikra Kodesh. In a parallel pasuk in Parshat Pinchas, describing the Korbanot Musaf, Bechodesh Hashvi Bechad Bechodesh, Mikra Kodesh Yelachem, Komelechet Avoda Lota Asu, Yom Trua Yelachem. Okay, I think there are a couple of interesting things here. One of them is that there's a, a, something glaringly lacking here. If we're talking about the festival of Rosh Hashanah, what's lacking from these psukim? Nothing about the beginning of the year. There's nothing about Rosh Hashanah. In fact, the very distinct impression you get from the psukim is that it's the middle of the year, not the beginning of the year. This is the, the midpoint of the year. It is not the Rosh Hashanah. The term Rosh Hashanah appears exactly once in the entire Tanakh, and it's not clear what time of year it's referring to. Okay, it appears in, in, in Yechezkel, Perak Mem, okay, and it talks about Rosh Hashanah on the 10th of the month. That might be Yom Kippur, but it also might be the 10th of Nisan. Okay, it's re really not possible to know from, from there. So Rosh Hashanah, the, the very fact that Chazal chose the term Rosh Hashanah for this festival is, is something interesting and challenging in its own right. Now, other than but that- you have, the, you have the phrase, Me Reshit Hashanah. Good. Okay, we have Merishit Hashanah, Yarachariit Hashanah. We just had that recently in Parshat Hashavua. And assuming that that's referring to rainfall, the context seems to relate it to rainfall, that would probably, Reshit Hashanah would probably be around the beginning of the rainy season, which would place it at this time of year. Okay? And we'll see in another couple of minutes that there is some basis in the Tanakh we're seeing this as the beginning of the year and not the and not the middle of the year. But the Torah doesn't seem to do very much about that when it describes the festival. In fact, what do we know about this festival? Actually, very little. All we know, it's a Shabbaton, which is true of vir virtually all the festivals, and it's Zichron Teruah a memorial of blowing of trumpets, whatever that means. And in Bamidbar, it says Yom Trua, a day of blowing of trumpets. Now here's something else is glaringly absent. What trumpets are we talking about? Now we assume we're talking about a shofar because that's what we do. Torah doesn't say so, just says trumpets for all we know. And by the way, Trua doesn't necessarily mean trumpets, it could mean trumpeting, which you might be doing with your mouth. You might be doing it, you know, vocally rather than instrumentally. Uh, that's entirely possible from the psukim. So the Torah is really very enigmatic as to what this festival is about. Okay. So, the Torah, from the Torah, you might very well think that we're talking about the chatzotrot. I don't see the word true at all. Right. The word true does appear. All over the place. You know, once right. wants to see the word true. Right. So if I had nothing but the Torah, I would say true means chasal throat until proven otherwise. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, in Bamidbar, true is associated with chasal throat. There is one place where true is associated with a shofar, and that is during the Jubilee year. Okay, and Yom Kippur, the Jubilee year, okay, it says, Taviru shofar vavartem shofar trua b'chodesh ha-shvi'i b'asrol ha-chodesh. Okay, so I would say from the Torah, it's a toss-up, whether we're talking about 
a shofar or whether we're talking about uh, 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 talking about chatzot As we'll see when we get to the third chapter of the Mishnah, the Mishnah has something very interesting to do with that with that ambiguity. Okay, but in any event, the Torah really really leaves the Torah Shabbat a lot of work to do in fleshing out this holiday. What does zichron mean? What does trua mean? What trumpets are we blowing? Assuming we are blowing trumpets. What does a trua sound like? What is the zikaron that we're talking about? Why does the Torah once use the term zichron trua in another place? Calls it a yom trua. What, what might that difference indicate? And, and why? Why are we blowing trumpets on this day? What, what, what would blowing trumpets represent? Blowing trumpets, if you, you know, if you just examine the sources, they can have a lot of uses, okay? Can be used to convene an assembly. It can be used to, for other kinds of public announcements. It can be used to indicate joy. It can be used to indicate prayer or, or distress. Okay, there, there, there are various different ideas that might be associated with the trumpeting. What kind of day is this? It's really very hard to know. Okay, now, uh, just before looking at the Mishnah, just one further thing, since we had this ambiguity as to whether it's the beginning of the year or not, so I just I brought just brought two out of several psukim that give us an indication. Shmot Parakud Bet, Achodesh Hazel Lachem Rosh Kodashim, Mishonu Lachem Lechodjashana. It's talking about Nisan. Nisan is the first of the months. That's how the Torah always enumerates the festivals of the year. Always starts with Pesach, Chag HaMatzot, and continues on through Tishrei. The last festivals the Torah talks about are all in Tishrei. Festivals we have later than Tishrei in the winter time are all rabbinic in nature, so the Torah doesn't mention them. Okay, so here we have an indication that the year begins in Nisan, but on the other hand, not that far off in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Torah, we have a Chag HaSith, B'Tzei Tashana, Bospechat Maasecha Min HaSadeh. The Feast of Harvest, that is the Sukkot festival, and that's B'Tzei Tashana. Okay, the time uh, when you have finished gathering in the yearly harvest. Okay, and that is Sukkot. Sukkot is in Tishrei, so that means the changing of the years is in Tishrei. So the Torah already indicates that there is more than one Rosh Shana. Okay, the Torah basically gives us two Rosh Hashanah. Okay, now let's jump to the Mishnah. Okay, um, here, let's get that on our screen. Um, Here we go. Okay, here we have the the text of the Mishnah. Okay. Um, so let's just briefly uh, survey the first chapter of Rosh Hashanah, which is the chapter we'll be studying this evening. Arba'a Rosh Hashanim him. Not two, as we saw in the Torah, four. Echad Benisan, of course, we expected that, but it's also associated with certain, certain uh, 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 annual events that we need to uh, measure. Okay, in terms of year, we need to associate with this year or that year. Rosh Hashanah Limlachim, Lirigali. I'm not going to translate, I have the translation for you up on the screen. So, whoever needs the translation, please make use of that. Uh, then, before we get to Tishrei, we have Echad Be'elul, which is Rosh Hashanah Lamaser Be'ma. There's a dispute about that. Then we come to Be'echad Be'tishrei. Okay. That's our Rosh Hashanah, and that's Rosh Hashanah. Here we have a nice long list. Shanim, Shmitim, Yovlot, Netiyah, 
the Yerakot. Those are all governed by the Rosh Hashanah of Echad B'Tishrei. And the fourth one is Bechad B'Shvat Rosh Hashanah Lilan, Kedivrei Beit Shamayin Beit Hillel, gives us the more familiar Hamisha Sarbo, otherwise known as Tu B'Shvat. Okay, that's the first mission. The first Mishnah outlines four Rosh Hashanah. Okay, that, I, what's surprising is that the two have mushroomed into four. And it's also not really talking about the festival of Rosh Hashanah, but talking about the very concept of Rosh Hashanah. So in that sense, it's surprising because the Torah never told us this was Rosh Hashanah. And that seems to be the first thing that interests the Mishnah. Okay, well, let's continue. Which is Shavuot, Al Maron, or in more accurate manuscript versions, Kiv Nu Maron. And Nu Maron is not, you know, we translate B'nai Maron usually as sheep following a Talmudic explanation and the well-known piyut unetane uh, tokef, but the the uh, the likelier text here is nu maron, which means a uh, a battalion, okay, battalion of troops. Okay, pass before him like a battalion. Uvachag, which is sukot nidonim al hamay, or judge for the yearly. Rainfall. What's this Mishnah doing here? Okay, so it's not really about Rosh Hashanah per se. Rosh Hashanah is mentioned here, but it's about four different dates. Okay, why is it here? The, the, the most apparent reason for it being here is the number four. Barba Prakim, Olam Nidon. We have two successive Mishnayot that both divide the year. Uh, into four parts, but they divide it in different ways. Okay, the first Mishnah says the same way that you know we can talk about a uh, you know a uh, uh, a calendar year, an academic year, a fiscal year. It was for different purposes. We might measure the beginning and end of the year in reference to a different date. That's what the first Mishnah does. There are four such dates that govern different aspects of how a society conducts its business in the course of a year. The next Mishnah talks about four particular prakim. These are not dates. These are periods of time. Okay? And we're talking about festivals. Pesach is a seven-day festival. Right? Uh, Chag is an eight-day festival. Okay, the other two, Atzeret and Rosh Hashanah, are one-day festivals. Okay, but these are times of year, okay, when different aspects of our lives are being judged. Well, note, by the way, three of them have to do with the natural cycle, the agricultural cycle. Different aspects of our agricultural produce are judged during the three pilgrimage festivals. And on, on a festival called Rosh Hashanah, okay, this, by the way, now presents it as a festival, not just as the beginning of a, uh, of a stretch of time, of a unit of time, but as a festival. And on that festival, okay, we have a metaphor, okay, called by Olam Ovrin Lefanav Givnei Maron. We pass before God like a battalion of troops. And we also have a proof text. Okay, okay. Uh, the, again, the likeliest reason for this to be here is because of the number four, which already gives us an insight into the Mishnah. The Mishnah, although we tend to view it as being arranged topically, is not infrequently arranged associatively, not because of a common theme, but because of a similar word or phrase, okay, or some other you know, uh, uh, formal characteristic of the language of the Mishnah that 
that, uh, that, that, that brings them together. This is often understood to be associated with the Mishnah being originally composed as oral law. The Mishnah was not composed in writing, was originally composed orally. Okay, some scholars think there was at least an official written text that was kept in the archive, but uh, the contemporary scholars lean much more to the view that you didn't even have that. It was simply composed orally. It was designed to be studied orally and transmitted orally. And that's what was studied in the Bate Midrash. And since it's oral literature, so there are various uh, mnemonic devices or scholars I can talk about mnemotechnical devices that help you to memorize them. And the associative uh, arrangement is often assumed to, to, uh, to, to serve that purpose. Um, I think there are additional purposes, but we, we won't go there just yet. Yes. But don't we have a thematic conference contrast, namely the Arba Rosh Hashanim are um, in terms of human activity. Well, that, so there, there are four divisions of the year in terms of how we, in human beings, our activity, how we divide the year, while Arba Prakim is divine judgment. Different dimension of it. And uh, before we get there, I, I want to first try to establish a basis for assuming that Mishnah thinks along those terms, okay? In other words, uh, very often people have tried to analyze the arrangement of the Mishnah, have, uh, have thought in these kinds of abstract terms, human activity, divine activity, and so on, which are not terms you find in the Mishnah in general or in these Mishnayot in particular. So is that what the Mishnah redactor had in mind? I happen to think that yes, but I don't want to go there before trying to provide some kind of foundation for assuming that that the missionary redactor thought thought along those lines. So I think you know you're raising a very important point, uh, but 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 a point that, that I'd like to get to a bit further down the road. But before getting there, what happens after this point in the Mishnah is completely puzzling. Okay, up till now, we can understand. We opened the, by discussing what does the term Rosh Hashanah mean? And we talk about Rosh Hashanah as the beginning of a unit of time, and there are four such. Then, let's say for associative reasons, perhaps additional reasons that we'll talk about further on, um, we brought in another Mishnah with another four-part way of dividing up a year, four periods of time that have a special quality, that we that the Mishnah terms judgment, okay? So we, okay, we can understand we're still talking about Rosh Hashanah, but the next Mishnah will throw a monkey wrench into the works. Al shisha chodashim ashluchim yotzim. Al nisan mipnei ha-pesach, alav mipnei ha-tanit, al elul mipnei Rosh Hashanah, al tishrei mipnei takanat ha-muadot, kislev mipnei Chanukah, al adar mipnei Purim, shayah beit ha-mekdash kayam yotzin af al yar, Mipnei Pesach Katan. Okay. All of a sudden, we're not talking about years. We're talking about months. There are six months for which Sluchim go out. Now, why are Sluchim going out? What, what topic are we talking about here? Well, let's look at the next Mishnah, and we'll start to get a sense of it. Al Shnei Chodashim Mechalilim Shabbat. For two months, you violate the Shabbat. Who violates the Shabbat? And not, not altogether clear from, the, from this Mishnah, but from successive Mishnayot, it will become abundantly clear that we're talking about the witnesses. And how are the witnesses violating Shabbat? Well, the witnesses have to get, let's say, to Yerushalayim, if you're talking about the time of the Beit HaMikdash, or if it's not the time of the Beit HaMikdash, then the, uh, then the Mishnah might be talking about a place such as Yavne, where the high court moved, right? Remember Rabban Yochanan and Zakai established his high court after the destruction of the temple in Yavne. Okay, so very likely that's, uh, it, it's either Yushalayim or Yavne. So for the witnesses who are outside of the city, where there's no light pollution, right? So they can see, they can cite 
the new moon, okay, they can then go to the court in order to testify about the new moon, and they can even go on Shabbat. Okay, okay. Now, why specifically these two months, Nisan and Tishrei? Because in those two months, we sent Shluchim. That's puzzling. The last Mishnah told us there are six months where we sent Shluchim, right? In those, we, litakain, we usually translate in Hebrew today is to fix or to repair, but it means to fix in the sense of to establish. And in those, we establish the proper dates for the festivals, okay? At the time of the Mikdash, okay, then they would violate for all the months because then every Rosh Chodesh, you had to have a Korban Musaf. And so the witnesses have to come so we'll know on which day it's appropriate to bring a Korban Musaf. Now there are very, a couple of very puzzling things that just happened here in the Mishnah. One of them is the abrupt change of topic. We've been talking about Rosh Hashanah and dividing up years, and now all of a sudden we're talking about months, and how do we establish months? By witnesses coming to the court to testify, and the court then sends out uh, at least some of the time, at least in months that have something special in them. Okay, in Nisan, you have a festival, Pesach. In Av, you have something special. You have the Ta'anit, Tisha B'Av. We skipped over Shavuot. Well, we don't send out Luchim for Shavuot because Shavuot is not determined by a calendar date, but by Svirata Omer. So that's why we skipped over that. Then Elul, so that we'll know when Rosh Hashanah will be. Okay, it'll be uh, approximately 29 days later. But then interestingly, on Tishrei, for the other festivals that occurred during the month of Tishrei, and apparently we don't fully rely on what we established with Rosh Chodesh Elul, because it could be Rosh Hashanah still could come out on one of two days. So. We, we've shifted horses in midstream. We've shifted from new year to new month. Okay. And here are some of the other puzzling things about it. The Mishnah does here what it very frequently does. It assumes a lot of background information that it has not provided. Namely, that the way in which you establish the beginning of a month is by witnesses coming to a court and the court has to then accept the testimony and declare the new month. Torah never says a word about any of that. No. Beitin, witnesses, we don't know anything about that. We just know when you see the new moon, you, you have, or actually the Torah doesn't even say that. How do you even know that a month is governed by the new moon? Well, linguistically, it makes a lot of sense. There are two terms in the Tanakh for a month. It's either called a chodesh, and chodesh means renewal. What renews every month? The moon. The moon disappears at the end of the month, reappears, and when it reappears, that's the new month. Okay? So chodesh is probably built on that idea, and the other word in the Tanakh for month is yerach, which means moon. Okay? So I, the Torah ha does seem to indicate that, in fact, the months are governed by the new moon. But who establishes that? We, we don't know. The Torah never establishes a mechanism for that. The Mishnah does. And in fact, this is the subject of the next two full chapters of Mishnah. The whole rest of chapter one, the whole rest of chapter two, and even going into the first Mishnah of chapter three are all about sanctifying the new moon. That's what they're all about. But the way the Mishnah begins to present this subject is quite mystifying. What's the first thing the Mishnah tells us about 
uh, sanctifying the new month, how the, in which months does the court send out emissaries to inform the people that the new month was declared? Well, if we'd be presenting the new month in order, we wouldn't start with the emissaries, we would start with the witnesses, which is what the Mishnah does in Mishnah Dal. That's where we get to the witnesses. But beforehand, we've already talked about the end of the process. The very last step in the process of sanctifying the new month is sending out the emissaries. And that's what the Mishnah chooses to open with. And only afterwards, the Mishnah starts with Okay, let's just take a brief look at how the chapter continues, and then we'll try to get a handle on all of this. Okay, the Mishnah continues. So there's a question. If you are a, a witness and you see the moon so clearly that it's abundantly clear to you that that uh, hundreds of other people have also sighted the new moon. So you can assume that it's pointless for me to be Mechalel Shabbat in order to uh, go, go to the court and, and inform them. By the time I get there, uh, pr probably dozens of witnesses will have appeared already uh, uh, clamoring to tell them that they sighted the new moon. What's the point? Nevertheless, the Mishnah says, Mechalel Shabbat. And Rabbi Yossi demurs. He says, no. So it seems we have a question here as to how functional is this Hilo Shabbat. But this idea, by the way, is also very, very striking. It's not necessary for these witnesses to go. They can assume that the court already knows. Why are they violating the Shabbat? To what end are they violating the Shabbat? Let, let's backtrack a bit. Why do you violate the Shabbat to sanctify the new moon? But sanctifying the new moon is such a crucial event that it even warrants violating Shabbat. Very striking thought, very striking idea. Why? Why is that such a crucial, why is that such a crucial thing? Okay, let's continue a bit. Avu b'no shera'u atachodesh yelchu. Again, there's someone who you would have thought, even though he cited the new moon, no point in his traveling to talk about it because there are two people who saw it together, but only one of them will be allowed to testify. A father and his son can't both testify. Two witnesses who testify have to be unrelated to one another. You can't accept two witnesses who are related to one another. Rabbi Shimon Omer, No, Eidut HaChodesh is an exception. For Eidut HaChodesh, we are willing to accept, we are willing to accept uh, uh, witnesses who are related to one another. And this in turn raises some other fascinating questions. To what extent and in what ways are the laws of how to testify about Eidut HaChodesh based on the normal canons of evidence in a court. It's not a real judicial proceeding, right? Not judging anybody. There's not civil law, there's not criminal law. It's not really law, okay? This is ritual halakha. But for some reason, we're following legal procedure and there's a dispute to what extent the standard legal procedures that apply elsewhere in halakha will be applicable here as well. Okay, then the next Mishnah talks about Eloi and Apsulin, who are witnesses who are disqualified. These are witnesses who really should not violate Shabbat because they won't be accepted in any event. This is virtually identical to a list that appears in Masechet Sanhedrin, which is the main locus for, for discussing the laws of judicial, uh, judicial proceedings, including testimony. And then the chapter ends with the following. If someone sees the new moon and he's unable to walk himself, so then we, 
for we, we'll talk about that in a minute, we provide him with a donkey. Okay, we provide him with transportation, which by the way, is increasing the Chilul Shabbat. It's not just he who's being the Chilul Shabbat, it's we who are participating in the Chilul Shabbat. And if he's riding on a donkey, then that's transforming a rabbinic violation of Shabbat of traveling outside of, you know, going from outside of a city to inside of a city, more than a certain distance of al Mama. And now you're already causing an animal to work and carry on Shabbat. That's already And if we know that there are people who are waiting in ambush, now that's another interesting point. Why would somebody want to waylay the witnesses of the new month? Well, we'll get a, an inkling of that when we get into the beginning of the next chapter, that the the sanctification of the new moon was a subject of some controversy and there could actually be people who would might be trying to disrupt it. So you send armed guards to accompany him. So this has already become a whole communal event. You give him food for the, for, for, for the road. Okay, I mean, this is amazing. Now, who is the we here? Apparently, even before the witness gets to the Beit Din, the central Beit Din in Yavne, he appears before a local rabbinic authority, also called a Beit Din, and the local rabbinic authority will first ascertain that he's a witness who should be traveling. And once he's ascertained that, he will provide him with, with whatever public assistance is required in order to enable him to, to, uh, to, 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 to arrive safely at his destination and provide his testimony, okay? So this is really mushroomed into a major public event, okay? And then the, the, uh, the mission concludes with the following. Shal malach layla vayom mechalolin et ha-shabbat, yotzin leidu ta-chodesh, shenamar ele moade Hashem, asher tikru otam b'moadam. We now provide a proof text for the idea of Chilul Shabbat. And here, one of the mysteries that has been accompanying us through the last several Mishnayot is cleared up at least to an extent. There is a proof text for the idea that the witness should violate Shabbat in order to arrive at court the right time. What is our linguistic cue from this pasuk? What's our linguistic cue that you violate Shabbat? The word b'mo'adam, very good. The word b'mo'adam. And the word b'mo'ado or b'mo'adam in several other places is used by Chazal to indicate this is something that overrides Shabbat. For example, Korban Tamid. Okay, we just uh, just read yesterday in Rosh Chodesh, we read in the Torah, Isaiah, right? You offer the Korban Tamid bim mo'ado. Bimo'ado means even on Shabbat, you offer the Korban Tamid. Okay? Uh, and, and the same thing here. Since it is our obligation to proclaim the festivals at their appointed season, so to declare it an appointed season means even if that entails violating Shabbat, we will violate Shabbat because the Torah wants the festivals to be at the right time. How would I define the right time? What is the appropriate moed? How would I define it? Based on the evidence of this chapter, the appointed time, the right time, would mean based on the sighting of the moon. Once the moon has been sighted, that obligates the community to do everything in their power to ensure that the process of sanctifying the new month proceeds as smoothly as possible and on time 
so that the court will declare the appropriate day to be Rosh Chodesh, which in turn will determine that the uh, appropriate day during that month will become a festival. Okay, Yom Kippur will be on the right day. Uh, Sukkot, Pesach, they'll all turn out to be on the right day because Rosh Chodesh was on the right day. And if instead of going on Shabbat, I, I, the, the, the witness you know, stays put and doesn't, and doesn't travel, so the festivals will not be declared at their appointed time. And the Torah wants, wants them to be declared at their, at their appointed time. Okay, so that basically sums up what has happened in this chapter. Now, okay, now what, what uh, one of the things that, that, uh, uh, that seems to be puzzling uh, is that uh, in, in, in the way the Mishnah presents things is if we, uh, if we, if we look further on, um, here it is. Okay. Um, Okay, I have here a summary of the chapter. Uh, this, by the way, is a work in progress. Uh, a rabbi in South Africa is working on a written Mishnah course on Masachet Rosh Hashanah. Okay, he's been in touch with me. You know, uh, and we've been kicking around ideas for you know, how he can structure this course. And he uh, sent me a draft copy of the course. Okay, so this is not yet meant to go public, but uh, you know, here you're, you're getting a preview, okay? And uh, one of the things that he has in, in, uh, in this uh, booklet he, he prepared is uh, uh, topical chapter summaries, okay? So we see here, okay, content of this chapter, let's re review it, four year beginnings are in Nisan, four periods of judgment, seven months in which emissaries were dispatched to diaspora, Nisan and Tishrei at the time of the Beit HaMikdash, when the witnesses violate Shabbat. Okay, if the new moon appears clearly, number of new moon witnesses allowed to desecrate, relatives and freed slaves, thieves, etc. Supplies distance and reason the new moon witnesses desecrate the Shabbat. But let's look ahead into the next chapter. Okay, so we all look at the text of the Mishnah, but let's look at how the next chapter continues. Character witnesses for new moon witnesses and the requirement for this. Now these character witnesses is a direct con continuation of the previous chapter. The same way that the community sent provisions enabling them to, uh, uh, enabling them to, uh, uh, to arrive on time, they also send character witnesses here at the beginning of this chapter. And as parallel sources point out, even on Shabbat. And there's a clear proof, we'll see in just a minute, that the second chapter continues to talk about witnesses violating Shabbat. We'll see that in just a minute. But let's continue flowing with the next chapter. Reason that new moon messengers were appointed. Oh, that goes back to the new moon messengers. But now we have a background. Materials and method of new moon beacons. Okay, because before sending out messengers, there was another practice of sending out beacon signals. But once that was disrupted by, as I alluded earlier, there were those who sought to disrupt the process. Once they disrupted it, so we circumvented them by sending out uh, 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 emissaries, messengers, three beacon mountains reaching the diaspora, meals, extension of the Shabbat Chum for those performing a mitzvah. This Mishnah tells us that when the witnesses arrive, they arrive in a certain courtyard in Yerushalayim and they're not allowed to budge from that courtyard. Why? Because they violated the Shabbat. Now they were allowed to violate the Shabbat. They were required to violate the Shabbat. Nevertheless, 
if you have gone beyond your Tchum Shabbat, beyond your, the, the, the area in which you're allowed to walk on Shabbat, even though you were required to violate the Shabbat, once you get there, you stay put. And then Rabban Gamliel, the elder, instituted, he said, I'm afraid if you do that, witnesses will stop coming on Shabbat. And so he instituted that people who had to violate Shabbat or performed the mitzvah by violating Shabbat, uh, by going outside the Tchum, are allowed to uh, are allowed to travel freely from that point. They, they, they don't have to stay restricted within a certain in a certain area. So up till the middle of chapter two, we're still talking about witnesses violating Shabbat. So this then leads <clears throat> scholars to wonder, so why are the chapters divided where they're divided? The topic of chapter one, continues, it juts out into chapter two. So why do we end chapter one where we end it? Why don't we continue it until this Mishnah in the middle of chapter two? Okay, so to answer, to answer that question, um, to answer that, that, uh, that question, I'd like to take a, uh, a closer look at the structure of this chapter. Okay, let's go back to our text here. So, okay, uh, here, here we go. Okay, here we have, here we have the text of our chapter. Okay, before looking at this flow chart, okay, that I have, uh, that I have, uh, have up here on the screen, let me just review some of the questions that we've raised, okay? One question that sort of got eclipsed along the way was the abrupt, the abrupt shift in topic from Rosh Hashanah to sanctifying the new moon, okay? So that's question number one. Why, why, why is the Mishnah doing that? And in general, sanctifying the new moon takes up about half of tractate Rosh Hashanah. Only about half of the tractate is devoted to Rosh Hashanah. The other half of the tractate is all devoted to sanctifying the new moon. And it's not a, a neat division because we start off with two Mishnayot that are related to Rosh Hashanah and then abruptly shift course to sanctifying the new moon. Then in discussing the sanctifying of the new moon, we start in a very puzzling way, the six months that the Shluchim Yotzim, that's the end of the process. Why not start at the beginning? And now a further question. Okay, that's at least the beginning of the process because we're talking about the witnesses deciding that they have to travel. So that makes some sense. Uh, and we got, got some understanding as to why the witnesses violate the Shabbat, but Nevertheless, it does seem puzzling. Of all the things to talk about in terms of the witnesses, the first thing to talk about is violating the Shabbat. I mean, why not, for example, start with the question of Eluhein Apsulin, which witnesses are acceptable? Continue with what happens if you, if witnesses know that there are others who are already on their way, or witnesses know that. There are two of you and only one of you can be accepted. Why not start with that? Why instead start with violating the Shabbat? Why is violating the Shabbat such a central element of the Mishnah's discussion? Okay, so, and finally, why does the chapter end where it ends? So the first thing I want to do is just follow the language of the Mishnah and get a sense of how the Mishnah flows and once we've seen that, okay, that will set the stage for trying to get some, to, to, to make some sense of what the Mishnah redactor is trying to do in this chapter. Okay, so, so first of all, let's notice that starting from Mishnah Dalid through Mishnah Tet, 
we have a chiastic structure. Look how it starts. And the reason that Mechalim et HaShabbat is because Vahen Mitaknim et HaMoadot. We established the festival. And that's the reason for violating the Shabbat. Now jump to the end of the unit. Shalmalach Laila Vayom Mechalim et HaShabbat. Notice we, we have repeated Mechalim et HaShabbat. It appears also in Mishnah Hay, okay? But I think the, the crucial point here is, okay, the, okay, the inclusio structure, okay, that you open and close the unit with that. But not only that, the key word here, mo'ed, elem mo'adei Hashem, shetikrotam bimo'adam. And here we have uvahem et haknim et hamo'adot. Okay, now we also have some interesting parallels in, in, in the interim. If we had more time, we would take a closer look at this, but just note how we, we have both in Mishnah He and Zayin, we have a question. Does it make sense for this witness to go? Is he really necessary? And the answer of the majority opinion is yes, he should go. And then in both cases, we have a ma'aset. Okay, we bring a proof, you know, an example, a, a, a case study, okay, which is supposed to illustrate this principle. Okay, so these, this unit, Hey Zion, forms an inner unit. Dalit and Ted are your outer framing unit. So here you have a chiastic structure. I think that already gives us a sense as to why the chapter ends here. And had the Mishnah continued, we would lose this beautiful structure. Okay, now as we'll see, Bezrat Hashem next time, this Elim Oadeh Hashem Otam Bimoadam is essential for another structural feature of the tractate as a whole. Okay, so that's coming attraction. Why the chapter has to end specifically with this Pasuk, we'll see, I think, a very powerful reason for that when we look at the next chapter and especially the end of the next chapter, okay? But that's coming attraction, okay? But let's try to understand now, okay? That the Mishnah has really highlighted that Chilul Shabbat in order to establish the festivals at their appointed time is crucially important. The Mishnah doesn't tell us why. So maybe we'll get a hint as to why from the first three Mishnayot, okay? Now, first let's get a sense of what's going on in these Mishnayot. We wondered, why did we start the whole issue of Kiddush HaChodesh with Mishnah Gimel, which is the end part of the process? But take a look at the language of Mishnah Gimel and we'll see two very important features of it. Mishnah Gimel is a transitional Mishnah. It's a segue Mishnah. It links the first two Mishnayot to the next six Mishnayot. How so? Well, the connection to Mishnah Dalit is apparent. For six months, the, the emissaries go out. For two months, you violate the Shabbat. You have Nisan and Tishrei that play a major role in both Mishnayot. You have Takanat HaMoadot in both. In both you have, and when the Beit HaMikdar stood, then there would be additional months when you would do it. So these are two very, very similar Mishnayot. So Gimel clearly links us up with Dalit. But why is Gimel the segue Mishnah? How does it link up with Aleph and Bet? There's one phrase that links it up in a very stark way, and that is Rosh Hashanah. The term Rosh Hashanah make, makes its last appearance right here in Mishnah Gimel. Following that, we'll have to wait till chapter three to encounter the term Rosh Hashanah again. But that's not the only segue here. There's, a, there's something else that links these four Mishnayot, Aleph, Bed, Gimel, and Dalit are all linked by 
numbers. Four, four, six, and two. This, by the way, was noticed already by one of the classic Mishnah commentators, the Malekat Shlomo. Rabbi Shlomo Ha'adani noted this point. But it's not just that. Nisan and Tishrei play a major role in Mishnayot Aleph and Bet as well. And now what I want to argue in order to get a sense of what this chapter is doing is that, in fact, Although the term Mo'adot doesn't appear in the first two Mishnayot, it appears in Mishnah Gimel. That's part of its link to the next unit. But I think the term Mo'adot is very much present in Aleph and Bet. Not so much in Aleph, very much in Bet. How is Mo'adot present in Bet? Look at the four prakim in which the world is judged. The Pesach al Atzvua, but Seret al Perot Ha'Ilan, Berosh Hashana, Lo Bay Olam, Uvachag Nidonin Al Amayim. Okay, so now, what do I see? What are the four periods in which the world is judged? The festivals, the Moadot, the same Moadot that in Mishnah Gimel and Dalit make Kiddush Hachodesh so crucially important important enough to violate Shabbat in Mishnah Dalid, important enough to send out messengers in Mishnah Gimel, those same Moadot are described in Mishnah Bet as times of judgment. And now I think we're getting the real reason why Mishnah Bet follows Mishnah Aleph, not just because of the four. Mishnah Bet is here, because Mishnah Bet tells us something crucially important about all of the festivals. All of the festivals are times of judgment. Now that's something that might sound surprising to us. Okay? We, we don't usually think of festivals as times of judgment. We think of them as times of rejoicing. But if you look at what the Mishnah says, Pesach is a time of rejoicing for, okay, for uh, uh, the exodus from Egypt. But what's happening with the grain on Pesach? The grain is ripe and waiting to be gathered. That's the time of judgment. The worst thing that can happen to a farmer is to have a bumper crop, which he then cannot, uh, which he then, then cannot reap. Okay, cannot harvest. Why? Because it could, there are all kinds of blight that could affect the crop, okay? In Eretz Israel, we talk about chamsin. Chamsin, has been, it's been proposed, is the 50 days between Pesach and Shavuot, because that's the period when, if you have a spell of hot weather, it can ruin a good part of the crop. And there are other things that could ruin the crop as well, okay? So this is a time of judgment. People are anxious. They're rejoicing over one thing, they're anxious about something else. God is judging them. Beginning of the summer, beginning of the season of fruit, fruit of the tree. Rosh Hashanah is a time of judgment that has nothing to do with nature, that has to do with history. Man was created on Rosh Hashanah. So that's why that's a time of judgment for man. And Chag Nidonim Amayim, just before the rainy season. We're anxious. Will the next season be rainy? We just enjoyed our successful harvest of the previous year. We're rejoicing about that on Sukkot, but we're anxious about next year's rainfall. And if you look closely at the liturgy on all of these festivals, there are elements of these aspects of judgment that do come to expression in the liturgy. That's how the, that's how the festivals are presented. Why is that so crucial? I think that's crucial for understanding why we treat Kiddush HaChodesh with such seriousness in the months that establish the festivals, even to the point of violating Shabbat. For what do we normally violate Shabbat? We'll close with this point. Pikuach Nefesh. We, for Pikuach Nefesh. And for what are we violating Shabbat when we are testifying about the new moon? 
I want to suggest that the answer is pikuach nefesh, not of the individual, but of the nation, of the community. Because these are times of judgment and God wants us to have the times of judgment at their appointed times. And when we set these times of judgment at their appointed times, then we are hopefully Bezrat Hashem guaranteeing a favorable judgment and God will then grant us the wherewithal for the community to, sur to survive and to prosper during that year. But if we don't observe properly the Kiddush HaChodesh, we don't sanctify the festivals at their appointed times, then we could be jeopardizing the, the life of the entire community. Then our Tvua crop will not be successful. Our Herot Heilan crop will not be successful. We won't have proper rainfall for the following season. Man will be judged unfavorably on Rosh Hashanah. These are times of Pikuach Nefesh. There's not the normal meaning of Pikuach Nefesh. Normally, we understand Pikuach Nefesh as referring to something, as referring to something physical. Okay, there's a physical threat. Here, the threat is spiritual. But I think the point of the Mishnah is, it is no less Pikuach Nefesh for belonging to the spiritual realm. Okay, now that's an idea that Chazal derives from the Pasuk, that Chazal didn't invent the idea, they discovered the idea by darshaning the Pasuk, by reading the Pasuk as meaning you even violate Shabbat in order to establish the festivals at their appointed time. But I think the structure of the chapter is alluding to the rationale underlying this. The rationale, the Mishnah is supplying the rationale. The rationale is because we view the festivals as times of, that are so spiritually crucial to the well being of the nation that we have to go all out to ensure that we establish them at the appropriate time. And to go all out to establish them at the appropriate time means even to violate. Okay, now just to wind up, looking towards next week, we've already seen a bit of a preview, but one final point. After everything we've said, it will be no less than shocking to discover in chapter two that the time that we declare Rosh Chodesh to be has nothing to do with whether the witnesses saw the new moon. Even if the witnesses didn't see the new moon, the court can declare uh, the new month on whichever day they see fit. That sounds extremely shocking. It should. I think the Mishnah wants it to be shocking, but Bezrat Hashem will save that for next week. Thank you all for being with me and hope to see you all again next week. Ravavi, can I ask something? Thank you. Absolutely. Ravavi, can I ask something? Yes, yes, please. I, I wanted to point out that I never noticed it, even though I've looked at these Mishnayos, I mean, who knows how many times, but going back to your comment at the very beginning regarding the, the tension or the competition between Nisan and Tishri as being the Rosh Hashanah, it's interesting that I noticed that the very first four Mishnayot, which cycle through the year in different ways, they could have begun with Tishri and they all begin with Nisan. Right. Okay, that, that, that's correct. Okay, and that, that relates to another point that I would have been delighted to get to, but we didn't really have time for it, which is the year of months versus, versus the year of years. Months and years are two very different ways of measuring time and making Nisan the new year for months. Whereas Rosh Hashanah is the new year for years, I think it's also a powerful statement. But again, that's opening up a big topic that uh, unfortunately to pack all of Masechet Rosh Hashanah into four, into four one hour shiurim is, you know, is going to have to do injustice to a lot of very important ideas. Uh, no one feels that more keenly than I, but 
I think it's good if you all get at least a taste of some of what we're missing by trying to pack it all in. Hello, can I ask you something? Yes. Yeah. Um, Cause I have my hand up. It's very different. Thank you for a really interesting talk. It's a very different question though. You may not be able to answer. Um, I've recently reviewed a book on Rosh Hodesh Elul that it was um, that some people want to bring back the new year for animals, um, not sacrifice, but sort of rethinking it for our modern age. And when I say some people, I mean, they are orthodox, particularly in Israel. And I just wonder if you have a view on this yourself, or I could write to you separately if you want to leave. I, I don't, you know, want to keep everybody up sort of thing. Okay, it's a, it's a very interesting thought. Um, you know, in a certain sense, we uh, Jewish tradition has done that with Tu Bishvat. Exactly. Because the real meaning of Tu Bishvat is something that is barely practiced uh, among most of the Jewish people. It really applies only to farmers in the land of Israel, what Tu Bishvat really means. You know, yes. if, if you're a farmer who's you know, who's cultivating fruit trees, then, then Tu Bishvat is meaningful. If not, then Tu Bishvat really doesn't mean anything, but Tu Bishvat found its way into the calendar, you know, on, uh, on a completely different level. And there yeah. you have Kabbalistic roots for, yeah. for it. So in a sense, I think that's what these people are trying to do. It, it's an interesting thought. I don't know it's just, I, I got, I got how very, successful uh, that I got, can be. I got a very, very interesting. When I wrote my piece, I got a very scary message. I live in the UK, Manchester, which is very strict, Beth Din, who I know, telling me I was talking rubbish and that there were only three New Year's. And it's obvious <laughs> that it says four. And I felt quite upset because I've worked for them. I do translating and actually on Shahita. And the thing is that these are not nutcases in America and Israel who want to bring this back. And Tu Bishvat is actually practiced in my area now. We sometimes have a Seder. I agree that it wasn't, you know, when I was young, but it's, it's not against halacha to think of the concept, is it, of a new year for animals no, at no, all? No, not, not at all right. against halacha. And uh, I, I, I yeah. could see value doing yeah. that. You know, again, at least yeah. for the, uh, at least yeah. for the, uh, uh, mm -hmm. For the farmer who you know who, who who's tending his sheep or his goats yeah. or his uh, or his cows yeah. to somehow mark the first of Elul, even if not through Maser Beima, which doesn't exist today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark it in some other way, uh, you know, giving thanks to God. I think that could be very meaningful. Well, and, you've uh, really you've really made me feel a lot better. I'm going to tell them. Can I, I'll tell them that you are not against it, and this is very interesting what you're saying. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for taking out everyone else's time. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. And, uh, so much. I look forward to seeing everyone next week. And um, we have a variety of classes uh, starting in the next couple of weeks. So um, I hope you'll take a look at our website and uh, you know join us again. Thank you so much. Yeah, I hope also, if you can Will leave. If you could Were they sources oh. for this class? Um, I can send them out. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, you can send them. And also, okay. also, I would recommend uh, in advance of the class, uh, just reading through the Mishnah with an English translation. You can find that on Svaria. I like to use the Ala Torah uh, website. You can find the uh, both the Hebrew and the English uh, there side by side and just reading through it will give you a, a, an advantage in advance of the next class. Will, will there also be some time, um, and maybe it's asking too much because this was wonderful today, to reflect on the methodology. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're giving you know, wonderful examples here of Rosh Hashanah and your, and your methodology, which has been so important. Is there a time, will we have time to sort of step back and then reflect on the, the process of the methodology. Um, I'm just being curious about that. Yeah, okay, uh, excellent question. It's hard for me to answer that. I, I thought we might have some time to do that tonight, but I saw that, uh, you know, I was running into a time crunch, so that sort of got skipped over. I will try to weave it in to some of the discussion, as we can't have like a full dress 
discussion of methodology right. the way I would normally like to present it. Uh, if I can give a little plug for a rival organization, uh, there's a, a, a Bezrat Hashem Drisha will be having a class. I will be team teaching with another uh, scholar, Dr. Adina Friedman, uh, and we'll be talking about methodology of study of Mishnah. That, that will be exactly- Oh, the, good. Uh, when will that be? That there. sounds great. Then, then, then we'll be able to really investigate that. I'll try to weave some of it into our discussion here and there. I can't promise no, I don't you want to very much in, uh, very much in, but it'll be at the expense of content. Yeah, I don't want you to detract from the content. Don't do that because of me. And knowing you doing this on Trish, I'll check it out. I appreciate that very much. And keep going with that outline you showed us with that you're collaborating with your South African colleague. That was magnificent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll 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 tell him that uh, that you approve. <laughs> We're already, yeah, it's wonderful. Okay. Very thank good. you. Okay, thank you all.